But Peter, welcome to Let's Do Humans podcast. Thanks, Francis. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for Hello. bringing me down, welcoming me. Welcome, welcome to sunny Essex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to say sunny London, but you're in sunny Essex now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least it's sunny, not raining. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. But um, you've, you've got an incredible story, which we're going to cover in today's um, episode of Let's Do Humans podcast. Okay. And then we're going to get more into it in regards to what it is that you've been through and your experiences and okay. so forth. But um, first of all, just tell me a bit about like um, El Inferno. Well, what does the name actually mean? And what El is Inferno. it? El uh, Inferno. Yeah, the name in Spanish translates well. It, it directly translated as The Inferno. Yeah. But... Uh, the Spanish uh, use it as a reference to hell. Oh, wow, so okay. Olympian signifies hell to them. Mm. But a lot of people over in, in Ecuador and countries that I've been through, they also use that as a term for prison. Mm. So they say you're going into hell, Olympian, you're going into hell. Yeah. So that kind and, of sums and, it up. And obviously, <laughs> <laughs> that, that pretty much sums up the experience of what prison would be like in South America, yeah. and particularly like Ecuador, the place that you've had your experience in. But um, prior to us getting into the whole like prison experience, can you tell me a bit about yourself, like early years, like where yeah. you're from and what was some of the stuff you were getting up to growing yeah, up? Yes, so I was born in Stroud, uh, which is a small town in Gloucestershire. Nice. Um, grew up in a village called Avening, which is even smaller again. Yeah. Uh, what's the population there? What, of the village? Yeah. Uh, maybe 500. Oh, wow. 400, something like that. It's, it's one of those villages where everyone knows everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everyone knows mm. everyone. There's probably interrelated to them as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grew up there. And that was quite a weird upbringing, mm. actually, because um, we were kind of the outside family. Mm. My parents were a bit sort of hippie-ish. So, you know, small villages being as they are, mm. you know, as you just summed up. You know, everyone knows everyone, and a lot yeah. of people are related to each other's families yeah. in villages like that. So, you know, I was seen as the hippie kid, the outside kid, yeah. and to some extent, I was ostracised, and yeah. you know, went through. You know, I don't know. Used to get into regular fights with the kids from the, the campus yeah. estate because I lived on the edge of the estate, but in an old house. Mm. So there was always like a bit of tension between me and them. That's a yeah. class issue. Yeah, that yeah, sort of thing. Exactly. Not that we have any eye, we were actually lower. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, you know, formed up a little group of my friends who mm. lived just down the road. So that was our little clique. So we all went to school nearby in a town called Tetbury, mm. um, which uh, is actually Prince Charles has his countryside house just outside oh, Tetbury, wow. yeah. a place called Dufton. Um, Did you ever come across them? Yeah, we used to see him drive through Tetbury sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Princess Anne also lived on the edge of the village I grew up in, mm. at Gatkin Park, which is where they hold the um, horse riding horse event riding, every year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sort of surrounded by royals. <laughs> <laughs> is that where the name Posh Pete comes from? Because we're going to get into that later. No. That, that became your nickname down the line. Yeah, that's but, I mean, it, it wasn't really ever a nickname. The press uh, cottoned on to basically a, a good friend of mine from Wales. Mm. Uh, whose name is Mark so hi mm. Mark if you listen to this any day um, he used to call me his posh little English buddy <laughs> <laughs> so um, I told one of the press this and they just came you know straight away it was like oh yeah we're going to call you posh Pete from now on mm. and I was like well I'm not really that posh I mean you might think I am but I'm not yeah. <laughs> there, there is an assumption that everyone that's from England especially when you're speaking to outsiders yeah. are posh or, or, yeah, or, I think, or again, ass- assumed to be like tea drinking horse riders yeah because yeah. of the royals and coming from Gloucestershire yeah. and all the rest of it I suppose people just make that assumption which is quite wrong really yeah strange I mean I, I even me not even looking push or being push at that fact um, when I was in I remember being in New York one time and I went into a <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I went into a sports shop to buy some trainers or whatever it was and the, I said something. I don't the know. It must have been something random. Right, yeah. They heard the access radio. They go, "Oh, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that?" And I kept on asking <laughs> me to repeat it. And I heard <laughs> everyone in the background saying, "Oh, he's he's so posh." And I'm yeah. like, back in England, I, I'm a common East Londoner. <laughs> like, my accent <laughs> is. Over there, they think you're a prince. <laughs> over there, they think I'm a prince, and I'm like, "Yo, I'm gonna milk this for yeah, years. Carry on I'm just gonna that. carry on." Yeah, it's, it's intriguing how people view that. Yeah. So that was your upbringing in, in relation yeah, to. Yeah, so went to school in Tetbury. Mm. Um, did my, you know, all the GCSE thing there. Mm. Uh, did quite well. The GCSEs got mm. lower, I think about fourteen, all A's and B's. Oh, uh, yeah. So I was quite academic. Um, also into sports as well as the Cavs and the cricket team I played the rugby team football all of it oh nice uh, um, but during that period at school 
uh, this was uh, towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, mm. the acid house uh, scene began. Oh, yeah. Uh, all the this is a rave scene. Raves, yeah, yeah, the rave scene. So I had two older stepbrothers, one a year older and one about four, maybe five years older than me. Mm. And they were both DJs, both sort of oh, getting nice. involved with organising the parties and all that sort of thing. So being the younger brother, I started tagging along, mm. thinking it was all really cool to yeah, me. hanging with the older guys. Um, but as well, I mean, along came with that, all the drugs, mm. and at a very young age of, uh, I think I was 12 when I first tried smoking hash. Mm. So, you know, I quickly moved on to the pills, LSD, amphetamines by the time I was like probably 13, 14. Oh, wow. It's, at this moment, you weren't actually partaking in selling it. You were, you were taking. Well, it, it very quickly. I, I, I mean, I've always had an entrepreneurial head, yeah. uh, and quickly realised that you know if I buy half ounce of weed and mm. split it up into eights and teens, mm. that by selling those I can offset the cost of smoking yeah. what myself or whatever. So obviously applied that rule to drugs as well, mm. pills and speed. And at the time, going to the free parties, it was just so easy to sell mm. drugs because everybody was doing it. You know, there was no law, there was no control. Mm. Everybody wanted it. You know, it was a very different time to now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just ended up, you know, started selling it really to offset the cost of partying at mm. the weekend. Where, where, where was this at the, uh, currently? Was this in your area, your local? Yeah, area, just uh, in amongst friends, really, you know, because, mm. of, you know, most of my friends were going to the parties as well. Yeah. So, you know, me being the business head, mm. decided that, you know, <laughs> I'd, uh, you know, take advantage of an opportunity, I suppose. Yeah. And, and how did that transition into getting in, becoming sort of like your a career like when did the first <laughs> we're, we're, no, no career yeah, no, as such no. but when <laughs> when did the first when did the first start taking the move into you becoming a Bigger. proper dealer yeah yeah um i actually got a re from studying gc uh, gcse's at tebury mm. i i then moved to sarancester to an a-level college to do my a-levels mm. and that was when i had my first brush with the law because I, uh, you know, carried on the dealing there. Mm. And I remember one morning I was leaving for college and there was a knock at the door and it was uh, some undercover police and they arrested me with about two ounces of hash mm. and cut up into eights and teens. And uh, the college allowed me to do my A-levels, thankfully, mm. but threw me out, basically. Mm. So... Uh, I think I got ended up getting sentenced as a uh, probation, a period of probation. Mm. But um, I actually stopped then. Oh, you completely while. stopped dealing? Yeah. yeah. Um, managed to get a place at university in Cardiff to read archaeology. Mm. So I went off to Cardiff University and, you know, student life as it is, you know, you're yeah. not very wealthy, the student loan doesn't go very far. So people start asking me for drugs again. Oh, can you get this? Can you get that? Mm. And suddenly there's a big, you know, wide open new market for all the new students there. Mm. Um, were they asking you because you knew that they knew you were rolling with a particular type of circle, or were they just mm. asking you just being well, students? I suppose, asking yeah, everybody? yeah. You end up not, you know, yeah. because of being in the, uh, you know, the illegal party scene mm. and stuff. You know, you quickly find people of the same sort of ilk as you. Yeah. And uh, you know, then they start saying, well. You know, can you get some pills? Do you know where to get any mm. pills? And of course, yeah, I did because Cardiff isn't very far from Stroud, so yeah. it's not, what, I don't know, uh, 50 minutes on the train, if that, mm. probably less. So, you know, I started nipping home, bringing back some pills, some hash, some amphetamine. And then one day, a guy from Portsmouth, because uh, uh, I wasn't really dealing with coke at that point. Yeah. It was always seen as a sort of upper class thing back then. It's expensive. <laughs> yeah, expensive yeah. things that, you know, judges and film stars and, you mm. know, all that sort of set did, and musicians and whatnot. Um, but this guy from Portsmouth uh, or Southampton came out to me, a student, mm. and said, oh, you know, can you get any coke? And I said, well, I don't normally deal with it, but, you know, it kind of interested me a bit because mm. I'm not really trying to either. So I said, yeah, I probably can. So I made a phone call and sure enough, I you know, I could get mm. it. So I went home, bought half an ounce of coke, brought it back to the guy, and he was like, "Yeah, well, it's mediocre, uh, but can you get any more?" <laughs> I was like, yeah. "Yeah, sure." So, you know, mm. so before I knew it, you know, mm. suddenly I'm, you know, bringing back a couple of ounces, and it's just selling so quickly. Mm. This is whilst you're studying as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And before I knew it, I'd met some of the local dealers in, in, in Cardiff mm. who then introduced me to their dealers mm. uh, from Swansea, from the valleys, from Newport. You know, and suddenly I'm not dealing a couple of ounces, I'm dealing a couple of kilos. Wow. Tens of thousands of pills, hundreds of kilos of hash. Yeah. And then the pressure got a bit too much with all of it, trying to study and trying to do that. Mm. You know, sort of had not a nervous breakdown, but you got pretty stressed with it yeah. all. And how, put, how much was you making at this time, though? So you're a student studying and you're, yeah, you're selling I mean, kilos. Thousands per week. Yeah. I mean, tens yeah. of thousands. Or... Probably not. It was heading that way, yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably could be, yeah, between five and ten grand a week, I suppose. Mm. And now you're weighing out the option, studying, getting yeah, to debt, you know, or earn ten well, thousand well, a studying week. Studying archaeology, where there's not much money in it. Yeah. You know. um, even though I love the subject, and that's what I really wanted to do. Mm. Probably should have done medicine, but didn't have the financial backing to do it. Mm. So, dropped out of uni, moved to Bristol, where my girlfriend was living at the time, studying. Mm. Uh, and I'd already been introduced to quite a few people from Bristol, so I just asked around and said, you know, found a few more people. Mm. So then I'm dealing with the whole of the Bristol market as well. Oh. I mean, not the whole of it, but a lot yeah. of people there, as well as South Wales and my own area. And then I thought, well, you know, why not get someone up in Scotland as well? So mm. I actually set out to find a market in Scotland because I knew the prices were high there. Yeah managed to do so so now i'm supplying people in scotland and you know suddenly it's not a couple of keys it's you know it's, it was around 10 keys of coke a week wow. up to fifty thousand pills and you're heading up towards a ton of hash every two weeks 10 days two weeks how much are you turning over at this point now? yeah well a turnover yeah probably in ex- easily in excess of a quarter of a million yeah a, a week, week probably wow. making about uh, so I suppose 10, 15, 20 grand. 20 grand, yeah. Around yeah. that. But the, also blowing a lot of it, you know, partying, yeah. spending loads in hotels, mm. restaurants, just doing crazy stuff, you know. Yeah. Also so, started taking quite a lot of drugs as well. Yeah. It wasn't the best idea. <laughs> That's the thing. I think, what's that? The number one rule, never get high on your own supply. I guess yeah, that, exactly. That goes out the window. Which is but, very uh, true. But at this point, you, you hadn't had any brush with the law in regards to like your, your dealings. So. Well, I mean, I'd had that, that, that brush at... Um, when when uh, they arrested you at uni. Yeah, right? no, yeah. at um, Sixth Form College. Mm. Uh, which had, it did shake me up, but obviously not enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, the dealing carries on. Up until 2000, then I did get arrested. Um, I'd moved back up to Gloucestershire by that point. Mm. Had enough of Bristol. I think I'd split up with my girlfriend, and it was all just getting a bit too much down there. Mm. You know, a bit, bit like London, but you know, 24 yeah. hours a day, yeah, continual people ringing and just yeah, no sort of downtime. Mm. So I moved back up to the countryside, and um, mm. I think I was only up there about two maybe a year and a half, two years, mm. and got arrested. Um, walked into a, a surveillance operation, basically, mm-hmm. on a house up in the Cotswolds. And unbeknown to me, the police were sat there watching over all the comings and goings, mm. saw me go in, raided the place, found cocaine. I'd left by then, so mm. they chased me up the road in a van. I was in a van over the car. Yeah. Pulled me over, found a, a, a briefcase with, uh, I think, uh, either one or two thousand pills in it and uh, a couple of ounces of coke, mm. uh, some weed, a sawn off shotgun broken down into component mm. pieces in the back of the van, which didn't go down very well. Was that your own for protection or was that? Yeah, basically. I mean, obviously, I, 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 I tried to bro- say it was. Um, I mean, I was dealing in antiques at the time, so I tried mm. to say, uh, you know, I bought it as a deactivated weapon. It wasn't mm. deactivated, which they quickly discovered. Yeah. yeah right. um, but yeah, it, it was for you know, self-protection because mm. of what I was involved in by then. And I'd had a problem in Bristol with a couple of guys down there. Mm. A couple of keys of coke had gone missing. Mm. So there was, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, animosity between me and them. What was our keys that they've taken from you or you taking from Yeah, them? well, it was, yeah. it was two separate people, but, yeah. you know, the same sort of group. And mm. um, so, yeah, it led to quite a lot of trouble mm. for them. <laughs> mm. Um yeah, so that was another reason I'd moved out of Bristol as well. Yeah, just so to get away from all of that. Some the distance between that and yeah. me. How long were the police watching you, though, for? Before they um, they caught up with you the first On time? On that occasion, I don't think they were actually watching me. Um, did they, they were, catch you indirectly? Yeah, they were watching else? the house because they, yeah. they knew the guy was dealing there. Mm. 
I've walked in, walked out, mm. they've gone in, found coke, and thought, hold on a minute, perhaps that guy dropped it there. Mm. So, like, I mean, delivered it there. Mm. So, you know, obviously chased me up the road, arrested me, and then they put two and two together. And, yeah. uh, and realised that you were the main dealer yeah. in this. And not so the then guy. it all flipped around and it was all on me. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I spent just short of two and a half years on remand. Oh, wow. Where was it? Was this in Gloucester? In Gloucester, yeah. I oh, got, okay, yes, yeah. To Gloucester prison. Yeah. How was that experience? So that was, this is your first experience in prison? Yeah, so that was yeah. my first experience in prison and it was full on. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, because of uh, the... Not only did they find drugs in the van, they, they then went on to find more drugs at my house. Mm. So it ended up being something like 5,000 pills, um, I think about either five or ten keys of weed. Wow. A few keys of amphetamine. You uh, kept all of this at your place? Yeah, because yeah. I was out in the countryside. I thought it was you know, yeah. relatively safe because no one knew where it was. Mm. It took them three days to find the place because I wouldn't tell them where it was, yeah. obviously. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so got arrested with all this. What was the value of the findings, though? The first uh, time they put a value of 350000 oh, wow. in drugs and then there was cash. Um and some stolen property and other mm. bits and pieces. Yeah. So, so for them, it was quite a big, quite a big deal. Mm. And not so much that they 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 also linked me to some crime families up in London, North London, oh, Isl- okay. Islington. I won't say the name. Yeah. But you know, you you know if you know, <laughs> mm. um, which didn't help at all either, mm. because because of that link, the amount of drugs and the firearm and a police officer got threatened with a life as well. Mm. Whilst I was um, being questioned at Cheltenham Police Station. Uh, basically a couple of guys that I knew mm. thought that an off-duty police officer who'd been living next door to me mm. uh, was in some way involved in my arrest, which wasn't the case. Oh, okay. So, so he, got shaken, he got shaken down? She it. did, yeah. So oh, okay. basically the guy, the, these two guys that I knew had gone mm. into a bar where they knew there was an active informant, mm. said something really loudly in front of the, the informant, mm basically to see whether it would have any effect on me to then know if he was an informant, mm. which it did. Uh, she ended up in a safe house for two weeks. Mm. And uh, obviously they put me as a potential Category A prisoner, which mm. is max security. Oh. Uh, which was this is, up in Gloucestershire? Yeah, the first time I was out. the only potential Category A prisoner in the whole prison. Oh. <clears throat> so, for example, I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone at all. I wasn't allowed out of my cell. Mm. Uh, no one was allowed to talk to me through the door. This is other inmates. Mm. Um, to just go and get my food, they would have to shut the whole wing down, open the cell, two officers in front, two behind me, escorted oops, escorted mm. down to the hot plate mm-hmm. and back to my cell with my food. I wasn't allowed uh, to make any phone calls unless they were recorded. Mm. All my letters were open and photocopied. All my visits were behind, you know, through glass for the first six months. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they mm. really went to town on me. Yeah, well, what's this, like, did you find that the officers <coughs> um, or the wardens in this prison were treating you slightly different? Would they be more aggressive towards you or more friendly because of who you was at the time? Uh, I mean, no, I mean, initially, I mean, you know, I mean, they were very standoffish with me and very, mm. I mean, I suppose to some extent there was an element of respect mm. from them. Others, there was an element of hatred, I would, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a mixed bag of... Um, uh, reactions from them mm. but I mean as time went on you know and they sort of sussed out what I was all about and mm. I, I wasn't all this big gangster and dangerous and all the rest of it mm. that sort of relaxed a little bit but um, they did actually after I got sentenced they they, they were supposed to send me to a C category prison mm. which is a you know lower grade of security but instead of that they sent me to Parkhurst yeah. on the Isle of Wight which at that time was like almost equivalent to Belmarsh oh wow yeah. so you know so now you're with the hardened criminals now yeah, yeah. well not only that it's yeah. on the Isle of Wight so you're completely isolated you feel yeah. it's very a strange experience being on an island mm. because it, mentally you know that you're it's almost been like in a, in a different country yeah because you know there's, there's a there's a stretch of sea yeah. between you and home yeah. and, you know for, so for my family to come down from Gloucester it was like a I think three or four hour trip Oh, wow. Each way, so and a and a trip on the ferry just to get to see me. I'm sure it wasn't as regular as you would have liked as well. How, how often no, no it was only once a month for two yeah. hours. Oh, wow. So that was quite hard. 
I mean, I don't, by that point, I've sort, of, I've sort of got used to being locked up 23 mm. hours a day in the cell and, and not really seeing my family. So I just said to them, you know, just to come down when you can, if you can, once a month. Yeah. What are you doing to keep yourself occupied at this time then? Reading a lot, yeah. writing, uh, doing a lot. I used to do a lot of artwork, yeah. um, stuff like that. Is that where the idea for the book came, whilst you was writing this? Or was that in the second phase <coughs> that we're going to cover later Yeah, on? that was in Ecuador. Oh, okay. I mean... Yeah. I always sort of knew that I was going to end up writing a book. I don't know. That's what, sort of what the book was going to be about? Though. Yeah, I didn't realise it was going yeah. to be about prison in Ecuador. Though. Yeah. But, um, so it, now you're in, um, you're in this prison. Was it, was it open? Were you, were you still a Category A prisoner? Were you allowed Where, to roll? In Parkhurst. In Parkhurst, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the, it actually went from, from being in Gloucester where I was doing um, a painting and decorating course, and, mm. you know, out my cell a little bit. Yeah. Um, I actually went to Parkhurst where I ended up being banged up you know in the cell for 23 hours a day wow. uh, because they said oh do you want to come into a workshop and pack tea bags you know yeah. like the tea packs for inmates I said no thanks <laughs> yeah. I said I'd rather sit myself and read a book watch TV yeah. and or you know do some drawing or painting mm. or whatever and quite happily do that rather, rather mm. than sit packing tea bags for six pounds a week yeah. <laughs> no thanks mm. so I just did like about seven months behind the door there mm. Um, and then got transferred to a C category to finish off. Okay. You can yeah. actually watch all of this on YouTube. It's all mm. documented on uh, the first ever series of Banged Up, which was filmed. Oh yeah, Gloucester. Gloucester. Yeah, I've, I've watched that one. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's that's something interesting. Um, I, I came across while I was watching that one. So I mean, I've had mates who've gone into prisons mm. and stuff like that, and um, I've kind of worked in a prison sector before as well, but on the data end of things. Okay. And. Um, there's always Did you erase my sentence <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that type of power at the time maybe for a little payment um, no I was, I was working more for like a charity sector that I was yeah. helping like prisoners um, reintegrate into society okay. and stuff like that so and we're working on data in terms of like reoffending rates and mm. other stuff like that um, I was briefly there um, it, was, it was like a Christian based charity it was okay. a Catholic based charity um, they, they're still doing great work now but um, one of the things that um, I, I, I realised within the prisons um, setting is that there was there was a level of hostility, especially in, in the areas that I was working. I was working in South London a lot, yeah. and there was a level of hostility between like the prison guards and the and the prisoners. Yeah, and when I was like watching them and us, it's them and us, yeah. But when I was watching the um, the documentary which you just mentioned about banged up in Gloucester, in Gloucester. Th there was there was a weird element. I don't know if it was just because of the cameras were there, yeah. but a lot of the prison guards were like singing and having jokes with the inmates. Yeah, is that how it really was? Or was no, that just no, for the cameras? Because the cameras. <laughs> yeah, I, I realised that because yeah. I know from personal experience that that's not the case. It yeah, was very yeah, strange yeah, watching yeah, it. Yeah, They're yeah. all singing and dancing <laughs> and joking around and always jolly and I thought, no, is that no. really the you, case? You know, that you know the real I knew, I knew, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So off camera was completely different then. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it was completely different. I mean, some of them were like that, but I mean, the majority, yeah not at all like that mm. you know it was very uh, them and us yeah I mean I, I think again because I was there so long and I be, I, I became part of the listeners scheme <laughs> you know, which is um, the scheme that the Samaritans run in there mm. for people that are feeling suicidal mm. so I got trained up and I was doing that so, and I was uh, I think I was the head of it in the end so I would get called out 24 hours a day seven days a week to oh, okay. come and talk to people that were suicidal yeah so, you know, they, they became a bit more friendly towards me. But even still, I mean, in an English prison, it is the, you know, it is them and us. Because if you're seen talking to prison guards, it's like, well, what are you doing? And people mm. start thinking, oh, you know, you're snitching. a rat, a snitch yeah. or whatever. So I was always very aware of that and always kept, a, you know, a good order. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in in South America it is completely the opposite. Yeah, we're definitely gonna cover that. Um, so 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 now you're in um, <coughs> you're in Parkhurst. What, what how, like what are some of the individuals you got in contact with? Because I know through um, reading your story mm -hmm. in, in particular is that that's where you made a lot of your contacts. So prison prison is more like a breeding ground for more criminality. Yeah, yeah, it? Well, it definitely is. Mm. Uh, I mean, it is the finishing school for prisoners uh, mm. for criminals. Mm. Um, particularly, I mean, the higher level of security prison you go to, mm. the more serious the criminals are. So therefore, yeah. the more serious types of people you're going to meet generally. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that's where I made a lot of my contacts. Mm. I mean, I have done, but the 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 thing that I went on to do in South America was actually through my old contacts. Okay. Um, so my codees on the on that case, on the first case, actually ended up, mm. that's my co-defendant for mm. anyone that's watching, ended up in Parkhurst with me. Okay. And uh, I remember there came a day where I said to them, look, 
when we get out, if we decide to do anything again, or if I decide to do mm. anything again, I'm not going to deal in Britain because, you know, I mean, within Britain. Yeah. Because, you know, now we're known, my face is known, you're known, we can't really move that well. Mm. So I think really the only viable option is to bring cocaine in or, or mm. something from abroad. Yeah. Um, because A, is you make more money. B, I think it's generally easier mm. because you're dealing with less people. Uh, and yeah, it's the, yeah. That's, that but, was the plan basically. But, but, but that's quite interesting because, <clears throat> I mean, when, when, when you assume that people have been put into prison now for crimes committed and they're being supposedly punished for it. Mm. It's funny that now you're kind of creating a, a an environment for them to to yeah. kind of manoeuvre and negotiate themselves around like different ideas to yeah. <laughs> to make more money via, the, via criminality. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, to some extent, I know they do try and, the, the prison service do tr- try and look out for that. Mm. Uh, you know, they did, uh, if they see that you're, forming up relationships in there and mm. it's possibly for criminal purposes mm. I know they, they do keep records of who you associate with yeah. you know, during your association time mm-hmm. or time out of the cell they will keep a record of who you're talking to yeah. but I mean how far they take that I don't know mm. not that far I don't think <laughs> yeah, cause you, you're ma- you managed to do what you managed yeah. to do so w- what was the next step then in terms of like you getting into traffic and how was that process like yeah so basically I mean I got, I got released um from that sentence uh, went straight for how many one. years we, we did you just sort of three that's, uh, that's uh, combined oh, between Gloucester and, and yeah, Parker yeah okay. the sentence was five mm. so I did uh, mm. yeah just just sort of three I think it was in, in total uh, got released and went straight for a bit did painting and decorating and started my little company okay when you, uh, came, when you came out so yeah. you went legit for a while yeah yeah how long was you legit for um not long, yeah. <laughs> about six to eight months, maybe okay. a year. It may have been a year yeah. actually, um, but got sick of it. You know, you was know. he making money through this business? Though? Yeah, it was okay, but it's just yeah. a daily grind. Cause you know what I mean? Yeah. Coming back covered in muck every day. I mean, I quite enjoy it. I still do enjoy painting and decorating now. Mm. But um, started getting the phone calls from friends, old associates saying, mm. you know, do you want to come and do this? This is available. We we've got this option. Mm. We have got that option. So, you know, before long I went, did you know what, actually, yeah, I've had enough of this, mm. you know. An offer came along and I thought, well, that's easy, I could do that, I could make some money. So for you, was it always about the money? No. Or, or was it no. the, the, the thrill of it was, what you were doing? For me, it was very much actually not about the money. I mean, mm. obviously it is initially, mm. um, but I soon learned that with me, it was more the adrenaline, mm. particularly with the international stuff, because obviously the, the consequences are more serious. Mm. I realised that after the first run that we did out to Ecuador and brought back uh, like four, about four kilos of coke, mm. I realised that after having processed it out that mm. it wasn't so much the money, it was the planning of the whole deal and pulling it off and mm. getting away with it and, you know, yeah. getting it through. And how, was, how was that first trip like? So, like, you, you've got the corner. How, how did the whole process come yeah, about so, for you to end up in Ecuador? So I hooked up with some... Basically, I, I got a friend of mine to uh, find me a contact up in London. Mm. So I came up to London, uh, to Kennington, I think it was. Oh, yeah, South London. Yeah, South yeah. London. Met some Colombians mm. and uh, uh, another guy from Chile. And basically, we started doing a couple of deals with them just in Britain, mm. just to, you know work out who was who and what was what mm. and on about the third one um, I just said to him look actually the real purpose of me being here is because I wanted to start importing coke mm. and thought you might be able to hook us up with somebody over in Colombia and they said well actually we're already bringing in coke and we're already bringing it in in plastic mm. and I'd already I'd, I'd hit upon the idea of you know converting it into plastic or rubber when mm. I was in Parkhurst after reading a newspaper article yeah. So I was like, "Wow, this is good. This is like divine intervention." <laughs> you mm. know, these. Oh, so, so is this is molding the, the 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 cocaine into plastic. So they actually or processing it. Process. I mean, they they get the coke, put it into liquid plastic, mm. and then let that set into like a a, a, a thin um, sheet of rubber, a bit like yeah. uh, the inner tube of a bicycle okay. tire, that sort of rubber, uh, and then just put it as a sheet into the bottom of the the tent. Yeah. Which was what we were using as camouflage. Um, and I decided to do the first trip myself oh, wow. because yeah. I thought I'm not going to send somebody to do something that I've not already done myself yeah. 
because I'm not going to know how it feels. I'm not going to know what they might be going through, how they're going to feel, what mm. they might encounter, problems, all the rest of it. So flew out to Ecuador. You know, we'd all we'd had it all arranged, things mm. made up. Uh, the guy brought it down from Colombia to uh, to Ecuador to Quito. Um, so yeah, flown out there with KLM. Had a little holiday. Mm. Met the guy, this ex-military guy from Colombia, six foot two, crew cut. Yeah. Cool. Must have been a scary sight though. The first time you, you get it the, was a bit some, scary, yeah. Because yeah. I'm sure you've watched all the all the films then now, Scarface. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're all about like um, Pablo Escobar and all that yeah. stuff. So now you're you're facing. I've, I've met some of his friends actually. Oh wow, Pablo Escobar's cool. friends. Yeah. Since being in prison in Ecuador. Yeah. But um, yeah, the first the first uh, trip, you know, the guy sent a, a taxi for me, mm. collected me from the hotel, so we disappeared up into. The, up into the barrios, you know, the the surrounding towns of, of Quito, you mm. know, the rough areas, not knowing where mm. I was going, and it's at night time, mm. pulled up near this garage, and uh, the, the guy's going, oh, you know, jump out here, so I wait in there, and this guy's approached me, mm. he was the Colombian, taking me to this uh, gated compound, walked up some stairs, through a door, door's closed behind me, and there's a, there's a, like a rifle on the back of the door, wow. <laughs> so I'm now in this building, there's obviously guns present. Mm. I'm like, you know, I'm thinking, God, am I going to walk out of here alive? Mm. And, uh, you know, we're all a bit tense, all a bit nervous because it's the first one. And uh, they said, you know, come here, come here, look at this. So they've rolled out the tent and he's cut open just a little corner of it and he's going to mm. chew this. And, you know, I've realised that by chewing it, I'm going to see whether there's coke in it or not because my mouth is going to go numb. Yeah. So a little chew on the corner of this tent. <laughs> And sure enough, my mouth's gone numb. I've gone, yeah, that's great. <laughs> it's all good. I'm good yeah. to go. Um, so, yeah, taking it to the airport, which was a deal in itself, because I got to the airport mm. not realising that there was a luggage allowance of about 30 kilos. Oh, okay. And how big was this tent? This 10-man tent on its own mm. was about 30 or 40 kilos. Oh, wow. yeah. And not only that, I've gone and bought loads of um, like ceramic plates and gifts for my family, like heavy items. Yeah. So they weigh my luggage, and it's over 100 kilos now. Uh. So they said, look, you're going to have to get rid of some of this mm. stuff. Uh, do you want to get rid of that tent? I said, uh, no, 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 I can't it's get rid of the tent. Item, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I've had to give away all these gifts, nice gifts of, you know, T-shirts and plates and whatnot to the mm. people working in the in the airport. Oh, you gave it to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah just uh, mm. you know, just to lower the weight. So now you're bringing your family back just cocaine. <laughs> yeah, just a, just a tent. Yeah. So obviously this must have flagged up with uh, I don't know customs or Interpol mm. or something because I've arrived in Holland at Schiphol, mm. and sure enough, there's a there's a row of um, anti-narcotic officers there. Yeah. And as I'm filing through, I've seen one of them look up. He's clocked my face, said something to his colleagues, and they've all looked at me, and I've gone, oh, God, here we go. Mm. So they pulled me in, and luckily the tent went through, um, you know, in... The scan, uh, yeah. No, no, it was uh, transferred, didn't come up. Oh, okay. From plane yeah. to plane. Oh, I see, yeah. Cause it, oh, in transit? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they, they've taken me into a room and interviewed me, and I've said, look, I was just on holiday, mm. Here's where I've been, this is what I've been doing. Mm. And I just kept a straight face and they went, oh, okay, you can go. Mm. So I got on the plane to uh, Stansted thinking, any minute now when I come off, I'm going to get pulled and ripped to pieces. Yeah. Went through, nothing. Got the tent, got oh. back. Happy days, yeah. processed it out. How, how, how much kilos was that in the, Four. In the tent? Four, in that Four. first one. Yeah. Wow. So then, w did you go back again the second time around or did you start sending I, No, that's when stuff? we started sending over the passengers. Yeah. Yeah. How often was he doing this? Uh, at least once a month. Yeah. Sometimes more. Bringing out how, many, how much? It's between three and five kilos at home. Wow. But when people say they, they send mules, <coughs> right? So how would you say, how does an average mule look like? So I'm in an airport. There is right? no average for a mule. People yeah. always say, oh, what's the typical mule look like? There's no typical mule. In fact, we would go for the, anything opposite to the typical. Yeah. So we've used business people, we've used elderly people, we've used Elder, What's the oldest do you say so you've used? Uh, the oldest guy that went over was like 82. Wow. <laughs> Ex-bank manager. Yeah. He's dead now, so we can yeah. talk about it, but um, yeah. 82-year-old wow. ex-bank manager used to work for Lloyd's Bank. <laughs> no way. 
It's funny because with stereotypes, it's always a bit strange because you're on the assumption that someone is supposed to look a particular way if they're doing yeah, something yeah. dodgy. I mean, you try to go for the opposite of that. Yeah, you go for the opposite of that because uh, um, gr- growing up, we always used to say that like they, the drug dealers, the local drug dealers, getting mm-hmm. caught in the little corners, the little um, um, black and Asian kids here and there. We, like they always knew that the people that brought in the drugs or that were bringing the drugs didn't look nothing like them. Yeah. Like they, they're under the stereotype that, or they're being judged based on the stereotype that the, every drug dealer looks like this. But the person bringing in the major bulk of the yeah, of the drugs into the country is completely right. opposite, and yeah. that's what you're vouching for yeah, in yeah, essence. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it's something that's well known, but. It, when it comes to like the the legal pressures and the policing, it always seems to be on the community with the the people dealing at the bottom end of the yeah, spectrum. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, that's where they start the pressure, isn't it? Mm. Um, I mean, I suppose a lot of the time, the higher up stuff, you don't really see. Yeah. Some of it you will when they make arrests, but mm. um, when they make yeah. the big bus and stuff. I think you're yeah. right, though. They definitely do apply a lot of pressure to the to the people on the street. Yeah. Because that's that's where the trail starts, I suppose, for them. Yeah, I would assume. Yeah. So, how, how much are you making at this time now? So, when when things got flowing, um, on every trip, about two hundred thousand to a quarter of a million. Yeah. Um, not not just me. That was split between three of us. Mm. So, I mean, that was the overall take uh, on each tent. Roughly. Yeah. And how long was you doing this for? Um, it went on for about two and a half, three years. Oh, wow, completely smooth without no police no, interference. No, or was no, it, no. We, we, I think after about, uh, I think it was after about the first six months, they raided a lab in Crystal Palace. Oh. Uh, this is your processing lab. Yeah, yeah. took one out there. Mm. Um, I was actually in Cali at the time in Colombia, mm. and they they busted the lab, arrested uh, two of my partners, mm. uh, seized a bunch of coke and precursor chemicals. And so Important. so they've, they've taken that first lab out in Crystal Palace and mm. I, I was stuck in Cali mm. and not really knowing whether it was safe or not to come back mm. um, because obviously my, you know, my two partners have been arrested. Um, and it was at this point that uh, one of them got released after six months, a Colombian mm. guy, I'm not gonna, I won't say his mm. name. But um, it, was, it became quite apparent quite quickly that he had been flipped by the police oh, okay. and had become an informant. I remember on one occasion he actually nearly broke down in tears and nearly told me. Mm. Well, I knew what was coming. Mm. So we started feeding him misinformation. Oh, okay. And uh, obviously by now we knew, I, we, I'd already clocked that we were under surveillance. Mm. So, you know, it then became a game of cat and mouse, but like, you know, for you, actually for your life and your freedom. And um, part of me thought, you know, I should stop. Mm. But another part of me thought, well, you know, they, they, ha- you know, that it's still coming through, but they, they're still not being able to get it. Mm. And I knew that because of British law, how it is, that they, for them to actually stop a, a passenger with that on them would mm. be very difficult for them to prove that the the passenger knew they were carrying drugs. Okay. Because we were very careful about. The passenger not having any record for drugs, yeah. have been quite straight. Uh, normally, we would pick someone that was working. Mm. Um, you know, again with no yeah. record. So, did none, any of your meals ever get? No, arrested? we never lost one. Never lost a meal. We never oh, okay. lost the passenger. Oh. Um, so, you made a lot of people rich then in this process. Didn't yeah, you? yeah. We'd yeah. pay the passengers ten grand yeah. plus all their all their costs, and mm. you know they have a nice little holiday out of it. Mm. But. Um, yeah, we we would always say to the passenger, look, if you get arrested, we'd make sure there was no linking phone calls between us and mm. or meetings. We'd be very careful around them. Because A, I didn't want to see someone going to prison, and B, we didn't want to lose our product. Mm. But it was more like I didn't want to see people going to prison because I'd already been through prison, and it's, like, it's not fun. Mm. So we would say to them, if you get stopped when you hit Britain, all you have to say is that, you know, you'd someone had approached you over in South America, you know, we know it's the old spiel, you know, mm. that you've been asked to carry this back for someone. But you'd said to the person, it doesn't contain drugs. You'd opened it up, you've ripped it open, mm. you'd had a look, and you couldn't see anything. Now, if you put that in front of a jury and say to any member of the jury, would you know that this sheet of plastic or this, mm. this ground sheet of this tent was drugs? There's no way you would. Mm. Every member of that jury is going to say, no, they wouldn't. And so, so therefore, conclusively there's an it. element mm. of doubt. Mm. And that's all you need in British law. Mm. There's an element of doubt in the case, and they can't convict. Oh, okay. Unless there's a lot of background evidence or 
mm. or linking evidence which we made sure there wasn't. Mm. So therefore, the British police knew, I think, that I knew this. Mm. So they, what they were doing was they would wait until we were processing it out and there was actually physical cocaine present and hit the lab. So then there was no arguing. There was no getting away from it. There's actually cocaine present. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, you can't argue with them. You can't say, well, we didn't know because they sat there. It's, the, it's powder. Yeah, it's, it's, you've processed it. But um, so d- during this process, did you get into any any altercations like with other dealers, for instance, or were there were there people attempting to rob you? Um, no. Do, or no one knew what you were up to at the time? No, because, because I'd already gone through all that mm. sort of trouble side of things when I was in Bristol. Mm. Uh, before I don't, you know, before I got arrested the first time, mm. I was a bit more wise to all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So we, when we processed it out, you know, we'd repress it, put a bit of cut in it, all the rest of it, so we'd bulk it up a little bit more. Mm. I I basically had two people that I would just take the whole lot to, and go there. You are you deal with that people I trusted with my mm. life literally. I would just drop it all on them. They would sell it, mm. come back a month later and pick up the money. That yeah. was it. So we kept it very. So you weren't directly dealing in No, we kept, we kept, yeah. we narrowed it right down to a mm. very small number of people. We obviously keep the number of people small, less people knew what we were doing, mm. less people to talk. And it worked well. Yeah. It meant that the British police struggled to build a case against us. And I think the surveillance operation against us went on for about two years. And, you know, we were, we were well aware of it. But being arrogant at that time, mm. and being, I suppose, to some extent, greedy, but also... In the back of my mind was, you know, I thought, well, they obviously know about us, so I'm pretty well fucked, mm. you know, so I might as well carry on, yeah. you know, until until it happens. Mm. Um, and that very nearly happened in Edinburgh when they hit a lab up there. Was you up there in the lab? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd been in the lab. And we'd seen the police undercover unit at the back of the building. Mm-hmm. And the two Colombians in the apartment had called me and said, look, we think we're under surveillance. I said, well, yeah, we definitely are. So I've gone in there. I've spotted the surveillance. The surveillance has spotted me looking at them. So I've actually gone down, got in the van, followed the surveillance unit around there. You're following them? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I blocked them into the car park. Yeah. And then let them out, made it very apparent that I knew that they were police. Mm. Followed them through Edinburgh for about 10 or 15 minutes Mm. and then tailed off. Went back to the apartment, uh, which is in the Leith area of Edinburgh. Very mm. nice apartment, big, you know, like merchant's apartment. Parked the van back in the parking space for mm. the flat. Didn't go into the flat this time. Mm. Got a taxi to a hotel. Mm. So I made it look as though I'd gone into the gone flat. Into the flat yeah. uh, and I said to the Colombians, I said, look, do you want me to get you out of there? I'll get you out of there. I'll, get you, I'll make sure you're safe. Mm. Let's leave because it's on top. Mm. And they were, you know, because of the way they think, they were like, no, we, we, we're we not sure, we think you're being paranoid, you know, we've got the coke out, mm. you know, we don't want to leave They wanted it. to finish their job. Yeah. yeah, they wanted to finish doing what they were mm. doing, so I said, well, look, you carry on. I said, I've offered it, you know, I've offered to get you out of there, don't blame me if the door comes through. Mm. Sure enough, what happens? I go off to the hotel, next morning I'm ringing, I'm ringing, no answer, the phone's hit. off. I was like, damn, this happened. So I turn up there, drive back down to the flat to have a look. Everything seems very quiet, you know, surrounding streets are quiet, there's no mm. police. So I think, hmm. Go, go in, walk up the stairs, get to the top, mm. you know, top of the um, stairs, and the door's smashed to pieces, yeah. all boarded up. I was like, Jesus. So I've just turned around, ran back down the stairs, left the building. Did you have a lot in the place, though, in terms of what was being processed? I mean, it was just just normal, like, three to five keys. Um, Obviously, everything had been seized. Um, So I've just just disappeared, basically. Mm. Uh, Not completely. I actually had to phone the police because uh, a family member of mine was actually living in the flat. The same flat that they were processing? Yeah. But I mean, because they, they, they were along with n- the Colombians. No, right? because I mean, they weren't processing. The, that that wasn't a continual thing. They they the, the Colombians had just come up to use the flat. Oh, okay. For, for like a week to process something, and mm. in that time, I'd moved the family member out. They had no idea of what was going in, mm. uh, going on. Sorry. So, I had to phone the police on behalf of this family member and say, mm. look, you know, they're not involved. Mm. Just lay off, you know. 
they had to that family member went in for questioning mm. obviously I didn't because mm. I didn't want it <laughs> but, but you, you giving yourself in that by making that call did you did you identify yourself as who you are so yeah you yeah yeah because I mean, I, I, I mean they, I knew they knew they who you were knew, yeah. I knew this yeah. you know but you also knew that they had to put enough evidence to yeah, exactly. order for them to So arrest, they said, yeah. look, can you come in for questioning? I said, mm. no, I'm a bit busy today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know. So, so then I, obviously I've disappeared back down to England and you, mm. you know, I'm still having phone calls. Someone there saying, look, we need to talk to you. Can you come in for questioning? And I said, well, now I'm back in England. I said, I mean, you know, I don't know when I'm going to be back in Scotland. <laughs> and they were like, well, they must you know. must be thinking the nerve of this guy. <laughs> yeah, next time, oh, no. But they said, next time you're up, can you please come in and talk to us? I said, well, I will do, but I'm not sure when that's going to be. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I knew that after about a month that the forensics is mm. going to be coming back and then they're probably going to come and knock on my door yeah. down in England and there's not going to be much stopping them. Mm. So I disappeared. I got smuggled out of Britain in the boot of a Mercedes car by the Turkish mafia. What? I got, yeah, I got smuggled out of Britain. Everyone's coming in. How, how did that come out. about? So n- now you're playing hide and seek with the police and you're yeah, back yeah, in London. Yeah, how, know, did it, now how did I, smuggling come about? So, I mean, basically, I, I know it's on top now. Yeah. So I just, you know, I had a friend in who was involved with the Turkish mafia, Turkish mm. guy. Mm. So I phoned him up and I said, look, I need to get out of Britain. Can you smuggle me out? Mm. He said, yeah, no problem. I'll come and get you. And uh, so he chucked me in the boot. This car. <laughs> Went how many, to Dover. How, how many hours was that? Oh, no, well, no, I mean, you know, we, no, no, I just drove down to Dover. Oh, okay, just to Dover. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and then, you know, the ferry terminal we got in the boot mm. or near there. And it's only 45 minutes on the oh, okay. craft. Yeah. So I just shot across got through the customs got out and uh, <laughs> yeah um, they sorted me out with the car after a couple of I think I was there about a week for that car mm. or two weeks what out in France yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so was it like had, a safe house or you just well we, we did, our family have had a place out there for years mm. so I just went down to there and obviously I, I kept it very quiet didn't tell anyone that I was leaving oh, okay. I dropped all my telephones all their electronic communication I left behind mm. all my bank accounts I emptied you know just anything electronic was dropped mm. and it was a bit different and it was I mean it's not as prevalent as it is today you know there wasn't so much yeah. you know Facebook and WhatsApp didn't exist yeah, this was only 2000 right this assume. was 2000 uh, it would have been 2005 2005 yeah early part of 2005 mm. like, uh, May yeah. around that so you weren't out here taking selfies and showing show no, your no, location none of that world. none yeah. of that at all mm. <laughs> so you know I'm still in contact with the Colombian, the informant, mm. I'm still trying to feed him misinformation and whatnot. And he keeps asking me, oh, where are you, Peter? Where are you? And I said, oh, well, I'm abroad, but mm. I'm trying to, you know. Is, is there a reason why you didn't pull him up on the fact that you knew that he was an informant? Was that strategic? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was, you know, it was either get really heavy with him mm. or or play him. Play him, yeah. So we, we tried to play him as best we could. Mm because, you know, I didn't really want to go up on a murder charge. Yeah. Quite frankly. Yeah. And um, so do, you know, go out to Ecuador to do one last job. Oh, man. Is this, is this, this, this is the addiction a, kicking in again. Yeah, so now yeah, you're, exactly. It's the adrenaline It's the adrenaline thing. wanting like to do. That one yeah. last job. Mm. And I thought, well, it's not me carrying it. You know, I'm not even going back to England. There was a pass. Shall I turn the phone off? Yeah, yeah. Vibrating, yeah. Oh, that's why. Which one it is? It's not that one. property today. <laughs> um. But what made you decide on the last trip? What was it? Was it was it the pressure from the the connects or was um, it all you at this time? It was. I mean, that last trip came about. I mean, it was. It was. Is that, oh, I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was vibrating again. Um, yeah, that last trip came about. I think probably out of greed, mm. out of arrogance, out of just the adrenaline. Mm. Um, I think it probably was looking for one last payday because I was going to keep on that one. I was going to keep all the money because I knew the guy was an informant that time. Oh, okay. So I was, gonna I was just going to yeah, I was going to leave him out with that yeah. time because I knew he'd I knew he'd really blown us up this yeah. time. So the plan was basically to get it. Uh, the passenger was going to come out from Britain. I was going to meet them in Quito. I was mm. going to send them off, 
spent some time with my girlfriend who I was also bringing out. Oh, so you took your girlfriend with you on this last trip? I hadn't seen her for months, so oh, I flew her out to Ecuador yeah. to meet me there, to spend some time with her because I thought it's nice and far away from Britain and, you know, mm. the police probably won't be honest there. That was a bad mistake oh, because then imagine. she got, so she got arrested into... with me yeah. and it's just, yeah, that was a bad mistake. How, how did arrest come about now? So this was prior to you being able to bring back the... the yeah, back, so right? we're all out in Ecuador now and... Mm. Basically, the, the the informant had obviously notified the the, the British police, and oh, okay. the, they'd notified the Ecuadorians, and yeah. and also not only that, they'd notified them that this was probably going to be their last opportunity to get me, yeah, yeah. because after that I was going to disappear to Thailand. Yeah. That's planned. where everyone seems to disappear, don't they? Yeah, I was going to go out there, wait, <laughs> yeah. and just spend six months out there, wait for the money to come over gradually, and yeah. just you know have a have a holiday, let things cool down a bit, mm. and think about what I was going to do next. So. Yeah, never, never made that basically. Um, mm. So I've picked up the the tent, taken it back to the hotel, put it. I was going to put it in a secondary hotel room, mm. but didn't put it in the hotel room. Gone out for dinner with my girlfriend. Yeah. Spotted that we were under surveillance again. I thought, wow, we've probably done it before, so we'll do it again. So the police were tracking you for yeah. like, your trip. Yeah. yeah. How so, did you notice them though? I noticed them straight away when when I first arrived, coming off the plane. Mm. Um, I think there might have been two Interpol officers on the plane with me, mm. uh, white guys, bold headed, you know, mm. mid forties, quite heavy set. Oh, okay. And yeah. I was thinking they look like quite police officers. Ones, yeah. I don't know whether they were or not, but coming off the plane uh, in Quito, I remember what, obviously you're on a second story, so coming down a set of steps and there was a woman at the bottom with a clipboard, and mm. she's obviously got my picture on it because she's looked at me, looked at the clipboard, looked at me like this, yeah. and literally smiled and ran off. Oh, wow. Got her colleagues. I've got to the passport control, and never this happened before. As soon as I presented my passport, mm. there was like three of them there, and they were like, "Oh, we just got to examine your passport a minute." So no, making it quite obvious at this point to the back mm. office, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm mm. definitely on top." Mm. So that was the first uh, sort of big point that mm. was a problem. So from there, I've gone into the hotel. And I've started to see things around me that weren't quite right. Mm. And after I'd picked up the tent, got it back to the room, and got out for dinner with my girlfriend, I remember being sat in the restaurant, and a white guy's come into the restaurant mm. and sat like, from here to the to the table there. And he's reading the menu, but I've noticed the menu's upside down. <laughs> I mean, it's just... Yeah. I mean, it'd be something like out of a spoof yeah. movie. Yeah. And I was, I was, I These are really well-trained officers. I know, right? I said, yeah. he was quite young as well. Yeah. I, said, I felt a bit sorry for him. I said to mm. my girlfriend, I said, you won't believe this, but this guy over here is obviously undercover. Look mm. at the, where, the way he's reading the menu. Oh, man. <laughs> so so is that, he has the menu facing you guys and he's trying to observe yeah. you whilst reading yeah, his yeah. menu upside also, down. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, he, he was, was by himself. Like, around the side bit. So that's why I could see it was upside down because I could see the writing. Mm. So he was obviously eavesdropping, trying to eavesdrop. Yeah. And um, it was after that, we've, we've walked out of there, mm. gone up in the lift. Oh, yeah. We'd gone to the reception, and the receptionist had looked up at me, and I was quite friendly with her because yeah. I'd used the same hotel quite a few times and yeah. had a few drinks with her. So she kind of knew what you was up to. Yeah. yeah. Well, she did by now, anyway. Yeah. And she's looked up at me, and she said, oh, I've got, you know, I've got my girlfriend with me, and she said, have you been to the Galapagos Islands? And she knew that I hadn't. Yeah. And I said no, and she she said, "Well, you really should go. You should really go there." Oh, so she was trying to signal you yeah, to. No, she tried to oh. give me like a little signal to say. You didn't pick up on it. I did pick up on it, and I was like, "That's weird." And I said to my girlfriend, "I said it was too late by then. They were already all over the hotel." So we got in the lift, and we've gone upstairs, and I'm yeah. thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, and as I put the key card in the door, literally all hell broke loose. Oh, yeah. They've all come out with their guns drawn, balaclavas on, plain clothes. Yeah. Please, 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 you know, uh, in Spanish. Was it just the Ecuadorian police, or were they... Dre were they Ecuadorian Interpol. Drew. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. get on the ground, you know, don't move or shoot. Uh, mm. I was like, whoa, <laughs> calm mm. down. And they'd obviously been into the um, hotel room whilst we were out, because... Mm. As soon as we've gone in there, they've just gone straight to the closet, the uh, wardrobe where, where the tent was kept, pulled it out and gone, oh, look what we found, what's this? Uh, mm. I was like, oh, right, okay. Yeah. You know, games up, basically. Damn. So now they've arrested you and your girlfriend. And my girlfriend. Yeah. So 
But did they do her for? They, they tried to, but I mean, they knew that she wasn't involved. But they, they you know, how they try and use your family against you as a pressure point. They'll try and use it as leverage. Yeah. So I'm. She got in prison with me, and mm. I managed to basically. I got her out of there after about four months. Is that because you, you took the full charge? Full. I you know. did in the end, but also yeah. I paid money. I could, you know got a good lawyer. Yeah. You know, made sure I just made sure, sure that she, she got good, out of there yeah. any which way I could. Yeah. So, she, you know, she got free and mm. I said, do not go back to England because the British police are going to arrest you for sure. Mm. And they're going to use you as, as leverage against me to try and fuck with me. Mm. So, sure enough, instead of going to Spain, I had a place arranged for her in Spain, an apartment mm. in Barcelona, read it all there with a the dog and everything. Oh, no. I said, you can bring it. She, she had a young daughter, a like, mm. 14-year-old daughter at the time, who was with her parents, luckily. I said, look, you can bring her out to Spain, mm. you, know, you know, live in the apartment there, it's, it's all set up, ready for you. Just don't go back to England, Just go to Spain, and you can deal with the case from a distance mm. and wait and see what happens, rather than sitting in a prison cell in England. Yeah. What does she do? Gets a fly straight back Street to England. England. Yeah. Gets back, he's, he's back like, I don't know, a couple of weeks, gets arrested by the British police, put on room. Oh no, she was put on bail. Gets found guilty at trial, God knows how. Wow. They actually fabricated evidence against her. They said that every time that she'd been abroad with me or... So every or, holiday you guys have been on... Or that, or, or that I'd sent her... Because I sent her on a holiday as well. Yeah. Her and the daughter to the Dominican Republic mm. as a reward for something. Mm. Nothing to do with drugs. Mm. I mean, I had passengers coming out of my ears, you know, mules. Yeah. Do you really think I'd use my girlfriend? Yeah. Of course I'm not going in. So they actually fabricated evidence and said that every time that she'd come back from wherever it was, that she'd been carrying drugs. Oh. And that was an absolute falsehood and yeah. a lie. And because of that, and, a, and one receipt that they found, on one occasion I'd asked her to go and buy some chemicals for me. Mm -hmm. Legal chemicals, methanol, mm -hmm. which is an alcohol, which is an additive in all sorts of things. It's a, it's a fuel additive you can use for racing bikes mm -hmm. or even in your car. She had a receipt in her name for some methanol. And because of that, they said, well, you must have known. Yeah, what it was for? 13 years they sentenced her to. 13 years? 13 years, and she did seven. They sentenced her to one more, because I got sentenced to 12 in Ecuador. Yeah. And they, they, they already, I'd already been sentenced by that point. Yeah. So they sentenced her to one more year than me. Wow. In Britain, I think, just and This to is say, someone who had nothing to do with it. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think that was a case of them trying to punish you, the fact that they couldn't get you yeah, extra that totally. back to Britain? But, I mean, yeah. So I they mean, had to punish someone just, for it. You know, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's so out of order and mm. should never have happened. And her legal team must have been atrocious. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tried to make contact because when she got arrested, she broke contact with me. Mm. You know, I tried to make contact with her and say, look, I'll take the fall in Britain. Yeah. I'll write a statement to the effect, saying to the effect that mm. you had nothing to do with to this. Do with it, yeah. And try and just clear you as much as I can. Yeah. Tell your legal team if they want me to do that, I mm. will, I'm willing to help however I can. Yeah. They never contacted me. And she ended up having to write the whole sentence? Yeah. How did she feel about years. you now regarding it? I've only seen it once in person in the street and she just said hi and that was that. Yeah. And I don't blame her, you know. Mm. You know, I'd be pissed myself That's if crazy. that happened. You yeah. know, and I feel very bad about it. And I'd say sorry if uh, that happened to you. You never should have done. Yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a lot of lessons to be learned throughout that whole process in terms of like t taking her <laughs> yeah, along to the trip, and um, keeping the drugs in the same hotel where she was staying in, yeah. and yeah. Uh, involving her in the whole process. But then then starts the next chapter of your life. This is now you being sentenced in Ecuador. Yeah. So how was that process like, and where did you end up now? Because I'm sure Ecuador's no joke, as, yeah, as we're yeah. going to cover in a set. Yeah, I mean, the, the first prison um, that I ended up in was in Quito, and it mm. wasn't too bad. I mean, it was very, it was an old, um, it was built in like the 1850s, so Ecuadorian-style mm -hmm. prison, very similar to ones in, in, in Britain, the Ecuadorian, you know, like uh, Wandsworth or, oh, okay, or yeah. Britain, you know, with the yeah. centre and the wings coming off it. Yeah. So it was, a, it was very much styled around that sort of type of prison. Um, and luckily I'd fallen in with a bunch of Arabs who all spoke English when I got arrested. Okay. So and they were quite well respected out there. Um, what were they in for? Same thing? Terrorism and drug okay. trafficking. They were funding Hezbollah with oh, wow. sending cocaine out there. I remember mm. reading about the case in the Guardian newspaper before oh. I even went to Ecuador. Yeah, and then you ended up meeting them. Yeah, yeah, I ended up meeting them. Right? They were actually a nice bunch of guys. 
Uh, one mm. of them was was married, to, still is married to the the. Uh, that time he was the vice president, Lenin Moreno. Mm. He, the guy, was married to the niece of the vice president. Wow! So, and she was arrested as well. So I got to know her. She spoke English. Mm. She obviously was in the cells with my girlfriend, so they mm. became friends. And uh, she actually looked after my girlfriend um, mm. for some of the time that she was in. Yeah. And obviously, very well respected. And I'm assuming being on terrorist charges, they were they were lifeless, weren't they? No, 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 they, they, yeah. they, they all ended up getting, you know, money tools. Obviously and they beat the case, yeah. And obviously having friends in the government and whatnot, mm. you know. They didn't beat the case, but they all got sentenced to like eight and 12 when they yeah. should have probably got 25s and whatnot. Yeah. And, um, but being with them was handy because obviously they were quite well respected and feared. Mm. So, uh, you know, went through the remand centre, which we only stayed in a couple of weeks, bribed our way straight through to the prison. Mm where we had cells waiting for us, we bought, you had to buy your own cell out there. We, well, you could yeah. buy your own cell. It's about two well, you grand. you in general population. Yeah. yeah, so you, you know, buy a cell, do it up, you could have whatever you wanted in it, TV, aircon, mm. uh, you should own shower in there, phone, computer, mm. I mean, whatever you wanted, satellite TV. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah it was well, very, money talks, as they say, so yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that you would be able so to. So, the wing of, the first wing that went into was mainly foreigners, which was quite mm. good. Uh, so, I ended up more or less taking that wing over, started mm. running things. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> with, um, with, with the Arab friends that you just made now? Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. yeah. One of them was in charge of the wing, so mm. I ended up taking over some other sides of it he didn't really like that yeah. so we ended up having a bit of a disagreement but what, what does taking charge um, like what does it entail um, I, I just do? sort of I ended up forming up a group of foreigners around us mm. all around me just to, so that we had a bit of strength as well mm. so that we couldn't be uh um, extorted mm. or taken advantage of yeah because as known South American prisons are usually run by the prisoners yeah, and the gangs exactly. aren't they yeah. yeah Quito wasn't too bad in that respect because mm. each the Colombians seem to have a wing to themselves, the Ecuadorians seem to have a wing to themselves, and us foreigners seem to have our own wings. Oh, so okay. I yeah. you know, just made the best out of it. So formed our own little, I called it Euro Banda. Because <laughs> <laughs> so Banda is like the word for gang out there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we were a European gang. Yeah. <laughs> um, started bringing in our own drugs. And so selling you started those. selling in, in the prison yeah, now? Yeah, because I thought, well, I'll offset the cost again mm. of... Um, you know, life in prison because it was it's all cash in there. Mm. Um, and how easy is it to get drugs into the prison? Oh, very easy. Just pay the guard or you bring it in on visits because the visits there came into the wing. Mm. And okay. every so all day Wednesday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday, your visits were in, in the wing with mm. you in your cell. Mm. Uh, so you could you could chuck the rest of the people out in your cell, have your girlfriend in the room, have sex, do whatever mm. you wanted. Yeah. So, I mean, so three days out of the week, your family and friends and girlfriend were in there with you. Oh wow! And every other Saturday, they could stay overnight with you. Serious? Yeah. To begin yeah. with. Yeah. That was what it was like for about the first two years in Quito. So mm. it was, it was just a twenty four seven party in there, loads wow. of alcohol. Johnny Walker, sixteen drugs, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drugs. <laughs> women, just... prostitutes. Wow. I mean, it's just nuts. Whatever you wanted, I used to get loads of bags of shopping brought in. So we were living. Yeah. Was it was a lot of violence in this particular prison? And how long yeah, was you there I for mean, in Quito? I was I was there two years because I tried to escape. Oh, you tried to escape from Quito? Yeah, I tried to dig a tunnel out there. We were talking no about way. blowing the wall with an RPG for some what? Colombian friends. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I need yeah, to hear yeah, the story. Yeah. How did that come about? So I ended up becoming very good friends with some guys from the FARC. Mm. Uh, Colombian guys yeah. because they were the guys that we got to bring the coke in for us so mm. we formed up a little clique whereby we were they would bring the coke in we were, we were selling it on, on the wing for the foreigners mm. and they were selling it on the wing for the Colombians so we became very close and I'm literally I'll be speaking to the guy later today mm. um, there's a guy called Mario who yeah just hit it off big time mm. And decided that, you know, we would watch each other's backs because sometimes there would be things, there'd be a strike in the prison mm. where the prisoners, if they were unhappy about something, they would literally just chain the gates, throw all the guards out. Wow. And, and then it would become charge. lawless and it would become pretty scary because yeah. then if anybody had a problem with anyone else, That's the then time they to get would get killed. Yeah. The, the guns would come out, the machetes, um, yeah. you know, and then problems would be dealt with and quickly mm. so it was nice to have a little bit of backup in there mm. so we had our own gun we got a couple you of had a gun in, in yourself yeah, yeah. yeah 
And well, this was all brought in by... Yeah, well, I, I tended... We had one gun in, in our cell and the Colombians had another in theirs. Mm. So as soon as it was a strike, they'd come straight for me. Oh, okay. I'd have my friends, European friends around us. Yeah. And then we'd, we'd just form up and we'd have, a, you know, about 20 of us. A little huddle, yeah. So, yeah. So, it's, you know, things are going quite well in Quito. We're making money. We're doing... Organising things by phone mm. and... Yeah, it's just you know living quite a good life. I ended up getting together with a girl from Manchester. Well, was she in prison? No, in we Mill? we we started doing a tour guide thing mm. in the prison. So oh okay, uh, tourists because because people could come into the prison into the wing. Mm. We hit off on this idea of well you know we'll put some flyers up in all the in all the hotels and mm. uh, uh, hostels, saying come into the prison and you have a little tour. In through that you find a girlfriend. Yeah, so I found a few. <laughs> <laughs> because well, obviously as well, because they could stay in in it, it yeah. was it was any woman or, or they could stay with you wow. overnight this uh, every other week. So if if they came in on that particular Saturday, mm. I would say to them, look, mm. you've you, you've hit it lucky. Basically, you have the chance now mm. to stay in a South American prison in. Mm. Sell with an international drug trafficker <laughs> overnight, <laughs> and the, you get to leave in the morning. You can walk out the door the next morning. The, well, the, there is the theory that people do fall in love with like people yeah, who've yeah, committed yeah. extreme violent crimes or like gangsters or something. Yeah, there's Females definitely do have a draw too. That. And girls used to love just wanting to stay yeah, in the cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so quite often I'd have like, I'd have like two or three girls <laughs> staying overnight. Australians, British, wow. Americans, Canadians, or all sorts of Israelis. Yeah. And then comes along this girl from Manchester who, yeah, I just became very friendly with. And mm. she ended, ended up staying in Ecuador for six months. We kept renewing her visa. And wow. just, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend came in every visit day, yeah. would stay over. Just, yeah, completely fell in love. It was That's great. Crazy. Uh, obviously, came a day where she couldn't renew her visa and suddenly yeah. she had to leave. Wow. Still in, I'm still in contact with her to yeah. this day. But, you know, she's married now with a with the family which I respect yeah. and stay away from that is a crazy story but t- t- take me back to the RPG story where you were planning oh, yeah, yeah. you were planning on blowing a hole into your cell uh, it, well, it through, the, the, through the wall into the exercise yeah. but um, yeah so we became friends with these Colombian guys from, from the FARC which mm-hmm. is obviously like the terrorist organisation yeah. in Colombia the guerrilla <laughs> and um, you know I I can see that the legal process isn't really going in my direction mm. because the British police kept coming out there and saying, don't release this guy. Mm. You know, he's wanted in Britain for a massive case there. So, you know, we we here is trying to bribe the judges. Mm. Just make sure he doesn't get released because otherwise we'll create problems for you, the judges. Yeah, so they'll put pressure on them to keep you in there. So I think, well, sod this. I'm going to try mm. and get out of here any which way I can now then. Mm. So start thinking about ways to escape which is something that you tend to do anyway in prison. You, you know, your mind just naturally mm. starts coming up with ways and means of escape mm. because it's, it's your natural instinct. Who wants to be locked in a box 24 hours a day? Yeah. So, the basically, because Quito was an old prison, a lot of, there were a lot of people that escaped from there using tunnels. Mm. It was on the side of a, a volcano up a... Oh, okay. um, well, sort of semi non-active volcano um, so therefore it's quite easy to dig underneath the prison because it was old as well mm. and dig a tunnel and we always used to joke that mm. if you opened up one hole you'd come across two or three other old tunnels mm. which was the case it was like a rabbit warren under there oh, wow. so we actually started digging a tunnel to get out bought a cell on another wing mm. on the obviously on the ground floor <laughs> and uh, commissioned some people to start digging this tunnel out for us so in the meantime, whilst that's happening, we start thinking of other ideas about how to get out. One of them was a helicopter lift off yeah. the roof of the prison because we could access the... We could Basically, we could get into the the um, exercise yard and from there we were able to overpower guards and get up onto the roof. Yeah. It was a little bit risky though because the guards on the perimeter were armed with rifles, M16s. Yeah, so they were like most that. likely shot you down. Yeah, but we worked out that what we would do is have a helicopter come down and have covering fire from on the ground outside wow. and, and out the helicopter. That was one option, but that proved to be too expensive. We were looking, I think it costed about 80 to 100 grand. Yeah. So we ruled that one out. And then the other option was RPG, <laughs> yeah. rocket propelled grenade yeah. through, through the um, wall of the exercise yard when we were on exercise. And then, yeah, and then just have covering fire again laid down from outside and just do a run around wow. 
But um, before any of this could happen, the tunnel was going along quite well. The guard sussed out what was going on. Someone mm. ratted us. Mm. And I got blamed as uh, being the head of a mass escape plan wow. to break out about 30 people. I think they said I was going to try and break out. Yeah. So they rounded us all up, the, you know, me and the Colombians in this little group, and they transferred us to all across, well, prisons all across the country. Mm. And in the process, they sent me to Guayaquil, which is the poor city, and mm. the prison there it was the fourth most dangerous prison. I've heard about that, yeah. yeah I've, I've heard about that prison. In the whole of the South American yeah. continent. Renowned for gang violence. The prison that was ultimately run by the prisoners. That and prison the gangs, was yeah. run by the prisoners completely from top to bottom. Oh. There might have been a director, there might have been guards, but they were all corrupt, they were all being paid, and mm. they were all living in fear of, of being executed by the, by the gangs. Yeah. Which, in my time there, three of the directors got assassinated because they, they, they went against the gang's wishes. Yeah. And numerous guards, I mean, God knows how many guards got killed, loads. How, how long was he sentenced there? Uh, well, I got sentenced for 12 yeah, years. I did long? two in Quito, and then I ended up doing... Uh, another seven in the worst, in, in one in, of the worst prisons in the yeah. world. Yeah, and I would, I did go through, I did go through hell there. What was the first day experience like? What, what was the general sort um, of setup of that prison? Uh, the first day was quite mental because yeah. in my time in Quito, there was a guy who had come up from Guayaquil who was a big gang member. Mm. He was actually the leader of one of the gangs, who I got to know. Um, a guy called Coyote. Mm. Uh, he's dead now. Got assassinated, but. Um, quite a big cocaine trafficker as well mm. but when he was in Keith I got to know him you know talking about business blah, 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 this that and the other so when I got transferred to Guayaquil he phoned ahead and said look this guy's coming down mm. you know he's okay I know him he's make sure he's looked after us <laughs> it was actually the second day I, I, I was there mm. out came 30 or 40 gang members mm. All strapped with handguns. All of them had guns in the prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah. the prison. Just came walking out the front gate. The guards just had opened up, let them come out, mm. and they all came out to collect me. I was—it was a bit nerve-wracking because I was mm. like, not quite sure what way it was going to go. Whether they were going to extort the hell out of me, mm. or they were going to look after me. So they pull their phones out and they go, "Look, you can phone your friends in Quito. We're here to look after you." And mm. I was like thinking, you know, to what degree? Mm. <clears throat> so they take me into the wing and sure enough they looked after me wow so you established a relationship with them based off of yeah. the vouch that yeah. you got from so the... then I realised that basically the best way to get get through this was to, to make myself a, appealing to them in mm. some way i.e. you know possibly future business trafficking mm. or just as, a, as someone you know that could help out with foreigners there you know or that was possibly someone that could generate money for them that's all they were interested yeah. in basically was money yeah. so we could, luckily because I had some money I could grease the wheels you know I'd give them a couple of dollars ten dollars a week something like this yeah. just to help out around the wing yeah. um, and also I bought a cell so that was a grand and a half down there wow. so that to them that was cash in their pockets so then yeah. they left me alone yeah. um, but yeah there was a lot of violence in that prison what would you say is the worst that you saw in that prison the worst that I saw one of the worst was actually in Quito before I got transferred yeah. a guy up there that they found out was an informant mm. got killed on a visit day in front of visits wow. um, they basically brought in a, a murderer which they call Comi Muertos out there which is mm. translates eat the dead because they're sentenced to 25 years with no parole so if they kill another one it doesn't matter it doesn't to them matter. so they yeah. just they, they they just contract them to kill people mm. if they need if they need the green reapers then also. yeah green yeah. reapers exactly so this guy gets brought in and uh, so a russian friend of mine came and got me said plenty i'll come and watch this they're killing that informant wow so i've got over there and Wait, sorry, got, so this is out in a visit in yeah area, well, is it, every, they're doing it on is. the inside the wing but there's visits, there's kids running through the blood. Why is this happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a, such a surreal and horrifically disturbing mm. scene. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I can taste it, the blood. Mm. It, like the smell and the taste, of, mm. you know, a lot of blood. The iron, iron, you know, yeah. oxidizes. I'll never forget it. But um, So I get over there, because my Russian mate calls me over and goes, fucking hell, come and watch this. Get there and there's this guy crumpled on the ground in this pool of blood and kids literally running through the blood. Why is it still happening? What did they do to him though? Are they shooting? So there's one guy, 
the, the killer. So yeah. he's just stabbing him, plunging him with this, this kitchen knife, mm. you know, wherever he could get in. Mm. And the guy's on the, you know, crumpled up on the ground going, trying yeah. to speak. Obviously, he's fucked. can't speak. The guards are just stood by watching, waiting Whoa. for it to finish. So the guy who's killing him stops halfway through after about 15 minutes, goes to the, his cell, sits down, smokes some crack. He's you know, all covered in blood, puts a knife on the table, smokes a bit of crack, has a drink, comes back out, starts again, he carries grinned. on, because the guy's not dead yet. Carries on, doing, you know, killing him. It goes on for about half an hour, and you know, by that time, obviously, the guy's bled out. There's a fucking lake of blood. Yeah. And um, so the guards then intervene. Now they know he's dead. Mm. Obviously, been paid off. And uh, just go right, everyone back to yourselves. Blah, blah, blah. Just take him off the wing. Took him back to the wing he was originally from, and that was that. And that was it. And that was the end of that guy. Damn. Uh, and then in in. The most disturbing one that I went through in Guayaquil was a gunfight that lasted for two hours between two gangs on the wing that I was on. Yeah. Uh, basically, when I first arrived there, there was only one gang. Mm. On There were two gangs in the prison, and there were 8,000 prisoners in the prison split between, well, basically, between uh, 26 wings, yeah. so they each had half the prison. Yeah. And how many guns would you say was in this prison? How many guns? Guns, yeah. Uh, Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, uncountable. Wow. Machine guns. Machine guns inside the cell. Uzi, and a, a, what was the other one? An AK-47, like the, the, the uh, fold-down yeah. one with the banana grip. Wow. Um, loads of handguns. You yourself? Well, we had a revolving yeah. Keto, a 32 yeah. Colt. Yeah. And then in Guayaquil, a Colt 45, mm. semi-auto. It was quite nice. Yeah. Uh, nine millimeters, Brownings, Glocks. They had mini armies then these guys. Oh yeah, 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 totally. I mean, I sent you the photographs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see the photo of the guns in there? I, I saw the photos. Yeah, yeah that was and all and guns and that they used. That was from the. Prison. Oh, so those are used ones you said. Yeah, 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 that was ones that had been used in, in, in that shootout. massacre that I showed you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, so, how did the shootout start then between the two? So two yeah, factions? so originally when I was there, there was just one gang on the side of the prison that I was in called the Cabanos. And then after a while, this other gang got brought in for, for a big murder case mm. called the Chorneros, who are now the strongest gang in Ecuador. Mm. So obviously, because this other gang landed in the wing with the Cubanos, they didn't like it, so there was a lot of tension between the two mm. gangs. Obviously, there was probably stuff in the street mm. that, where they had people killed between them, families and stuff. So <clears throat> I became very friendly with these the the Chorneros. Were the, was that the original gang? No. Oh, the, so that's the, the new gang that's yeah, coming to take gang, over now. Because they okay. were a lot more sophisticated, oh, okay. a lot more you know better educated, yeah. just more just nicer, greater yeah. people. <laughs> nice, greater, well, nice, 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 greater strong, killer. <laughs> yeah, nice, a strong word. Yeah, uh, but more like your type in terms yeah, of like yeah, dealings. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was more structured. So. Um, Basically, after a while, they ended up in charge of the wing and mm. they put me in charge of selling all the cocaine on the wing and the wing above. Mm. So, you know, I, I was very close to them. Uh, I used to cook with the guy, the main boss, uh, the main gang leader, mm. or the, the boss of them, sorry, his brother. I was very friendly with you. You lived in the cell in front of me and mm. we used to cook together and all sorts of stuff. So anyway, the other gang were pretty annoyed about all this. So they sent well, in the fact that you were working for the. Oh no, the fact that they were running this wing now and it, yeah. starting to have an influence in the prison. Mm. So they sent in a team of killers to take them out, basically. Mm. So one night, it was nine thirty p.m. I remember it. Uh, and oh yeah, the, the cells in this prison were open twenty four hours a day. Wow. Not the wings. We yeah. used to get close into the wing about five p.m. But the cells were open twenty four hours so a day. You can access in cell, yeah. Go wherever you wanted, do whatever you wanted. So at night it used to get a bit dangerous because mm. people would be drinking, doing drugs, smoking. You know, then the guns would be coming out, and uh, it's mm. like not the place you want to be messing about in. So anyway, I'm cooking this food. Um, one of these guys from the Choneros has said, "Oh, you know, because I was cooking like Italian food, it was a bit different for them." Mm. So pastors, he said, eh? yeah. "Yeah." So he said, "Oh, can you bring me a plate of uh, bolognese?" And I said, "Yeah, sure, no problem." <laughs> so. I'm cooking away and I'm just starting to sense that something's not right at the wing because uh, I keep seeing these like hushed groups of two and three people mm. like, you know, talking and working. I, I could tell there's something, something going on. You know, you get to know yeah. the vibe. Mm. 
and they have normally it's quite busy and there's people wandering around saying coming in saying hi and there's no one all the doors are mm. shut and I'm like so everyone wrong. knew something was happening yeah. yeah but I didn't know what so come 9.30 thereabouts I take this plate of food down to this guy mm. as I hand it to him that they've used me as cover unbeknowingly to kill the guy so mm. another guy's come up behind me and over my right shoulder a shot straight past my head blown the guy say you're him yeah. on, over my shoulder like this and blown the guy at the back of his head out right oh. in front of me dropped him so he's dead and they didn't shoot at you at all no so I was thinking yeah. fuck because I've been involved with them and yeah. so you know I'm, I've done a runner straight to myself mm. dive through the door slam the door behind me the ch- <laughs> there was a German guy not living with me but in the cell cooking with me mm. having a drink and whatnot. He's tried to open the door again to go out and have a look and see what's going on. And his name was Peter as well. And yeah. I said, Peter, yeah, what are you doing? I grabbed him back in. Yeah. There's bullets bouncing off the walls by this point. Wow. Like in, you know, not so now there's an all-out shooter between the yeah, two Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Everyone's come out. You know, the boss has obviously heard because his cell was right next door to the first guy that got killed. That's the brother of the boss, right? He killed. wasn't brothers, but they were family. Oh, I okay. think it was a cousin. Yeah. So yeah. he's heard this guy get killed. So he's mm. come storming out of his cell with two guns, mm. one in each hand, and just started Can't going bam, 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 you know. Yeah. And uh, I think there was about six shooters on the other, uh, on the other side, yeah. the other gang. Uh, and then another member of the other ones has come out. So there's two against six basically. Mm. And the second shooter that came out had an Uzi. Wow. So I've heard that go like that, you know. Yeah. Hang, a couple of hand grenades went off. Hand grenades? Uh, it? Oh, honestly, it was it was war. <laughs> yeah. So that's gone on for two hours. You know, we're in the cell, ducked down because of the windows didn't have, didn't have glass, and mm. we're on the ground floor. And quite often, people would get killed by another gang member coming out and up outside the wing. Mm. And shoot through the window. They would shoot through the window and kill people from outside. Oh, okay. Because say the doors locked and they couldn't get them through the wing. Yeah. They'd come round and shoot through, just the shoot through the window because there was no glass and just yeah. like ratings just because it's hot there. Yeah. So I sent to my mate Peter. I was saying like, get down behind the wall and like, because I knew bullets probably wouldn't penetrate the door because it was mm. a pretty solid wood door. But I was worried that they might put a grenade blow the door out and I was yeah. thinking any minute now they're going to be coming for me because I was sort of almost part of yeah, that associated, gang yeah. associated by selling coke from and I could hear bullets impacting the door and other things being thrown around and things oh it's just a nightmare Damn. you and know people for, what, two dying days? two hours or oh, two hours sorry yeah. that's long enough that's me. long yeah, yeah. no we've gone for it yeah. and in any enclosed space like that as well I mean the, mm. the, the sound it was so loud I mean, I mean my right ear was Mm. I couldn't hear anything then anyway because of that, that shot. Yeah. You know, I was totally deaf for about two months in that year. How, how did it end up like season in terms of the. the so the the, war? it's gone on for about two hours and then the police, what they would normally do is they just wait, wait until the ammunition ran out or so it died. So they leave down. them to shoot themselves yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just leave it to go on. Yeah. So they've waited the two hours, it's calmed down, and then they've come in and tortured everybody for another two hours afterwards. And it was just. Wow. They were getting, you know, to the, they were trying to work out what had happened. So they were getting people, taking them in a cell, discharging M16s up against their head. Wow. You know, make it, and then putting it up against them, making them think they're going to shoot you. Yeah. To get information out of you, and drowning people in buckets and electrocuting them, beating them, beat everybody. So that was almost as terrifying, if not more terrifying, than the actual gunfight. Mm and so that's, that went on for another two hours and then at the end of that they killed another guy in basically there was a space uh, which was the width of a cell uh, which opened out uh, into the exercise yard mm. that you'd walk through so they'd managed to get this is the prisoners now one of the gangs had managed to get the boss of the other one and they held him hostage they'd shot him twice in the stomach mm. and held him there for about 45 minutes screaming and shouting to the other gang members going oh no is he, they're going to kill me oh. and the geese gang shouting we've got your boss the motherfucker we're going to kill him blah, blah, blah. and then in the end there was a couple of shots and they just blew his head off just the actual boss of um, the gang uh, yeah, of the, yeah. Of, of, it was the boss of the killers that had been sent in sent yeah, yeah. yeah. so 
what they did was they rounded us all up, about 120 of us, and pushed us into this space where he'd been killed, mm. which was just full. I mean, imagine the space, so this, this from where my hand is to the wall, yeah. and about the length of the room, about that half mm. full of blood, an inch deep, where the guy had bled out. Wow. They pushed 120 people into this space. Into this space. To make us stand in his blood for about 10 minutes whilst they just showered at us, basically. Mm. I thought they were going to open up with a machine gun into there yeah. and kill us all. Because it's, it's happened before in South American prisons where and the they police just kill got off pissed, the prisoners. Yeah. And they just round you up and just shoot you all. And I was thinking, any minute now, there's mm. going to be a gun come out and they're just going to go rack. Mm. Which it didn't, luckily. But they. Yeah. Do you so, think a lot of it had to do with the fact that you guys are foreigners and they didn't want to deal with the um, international issues? Oh, that wasn't just foreigners in there. That was, I yeah. mean, that was... No, but I mean, like, in uh, terms of you guys being a part of the setup, like, did, did they hold back a bit because there's foreigners there? Who, the police? Yeah, the police, no, did yeah. they fuck? <laughs> oh, they don't? Yeah. No, they, no, 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 they beat us as, well, as much. Yeah. To be honest, sometimes that was an exception because of the shootout. Mm. normally when they came in they would leave the foreigners alone a bit mm. because obviously they, they, if the embassy got involved mm. you know it could cause them quite a lot of problems yeah. for them yeah. but I mean even still I saw foreigners get beat beat real have a proper beat down by the police yeah. and I mean I remember a couple of them did get apologies because they got the embassies involved but generally they, nothing yeah. would happen but what happened to the prison life after the boss had died and this beef had like kind of like subsided so again? yeah they, they, they took all of the Tron errors the ones I became friendly mm. with they, they how many took, people died actually sorry in this, uh, in this it, was, it was at least two I think three yeah I, uh, I, I can't remember I think it was three yeah it was either two or three but these are main people that are dying yeah these yeah like yeah bosses like gang leaders gang leaders yeah so they then took um, the Tron errors, they took them out of that wing. Mm. The, they actually asked me if I wanted to go with them. I probably should have done, but I didn't. Mm. Um, so they took all of those off to another wing and made a wing just for them mm. so, that, so it wouldn't happen again. Mm. So then I was left behind <laughs> with the gang that had thrown them out. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, right, this could be a bit, <laughs> yeah. this could be a bit touch and go. Mm. And sure enough... The next day they came round, they, they went round all the cells throwing the people out that they that they didn't like, mm. beating them, took everything off them, all their possessions, just beat the hell out of them and threw them out, basically. And luckily for me, a woman from the church who was helping me out had come in to visit mm. and saved my bacon because she was in my cell with me when they came to my oh, door. Okay. And there was a bang, bang, bang at the door. And I was like, oh, God, here they are. And I said, oh, God, here we go, Mercedes. Yeah. I said, hopefully I'll be okay. And I've opened the door they peered round my shoulder seen her and gone mm. yeah. is that because they're quite religious uh, they're, yeah they're, very very, very respectful of physics heavy. and all that yeah. you know and I've said what do you want and they were like mm. and I said look you know and, and they and they let me go but boy yeah, I'm, I'm with Jesus right now yeah, <laughs> yeah. But boy yeah. did they make my life hell after that yeah luckily there were, there was three guys in charge after that mm. and I know for a fact that two of them are dead now out of those three yeah and I'm quite happy to be honest about that because they yeah. made my life hell. Yeah. I ended up having to leave that wing and move to the wing upstairs, which the wing upstairs became a wing for foreigners mm. after that. Was so that safer then for the duration? It of was and it wasn't because, I mean, basically, I mean, my best friend ended up getting killed up, up on that wing. Yeah, by it, the by a gang. He, he stupidly tried to do business with them, yeah. ended up in about 100 grand of debt. Hundred grand a debt. Mm. Was his business uh, yeah, outside yeah, like of smuggling the prison. business? Yeah. Back to Britain and stuff. Yeah. And um, I said, look, you know, he was, re he was really close to getting released, and yeah. I said, don't bother doing it now. If you're going to do it, do it when you get out. Yeah. Because you know what's going to happen. Something will go wrong, and you're going to end up in debt with him, and you're going to end up. Yeah. Sure enough, it happened, and he was a week away from getting out, oh, and they came and strung him up. What they did was they came in the morning put him in a bear hug or a headlock or something, knocked him out, so he yeah. passed out, and then tied him up and made it look like suicide. Sure. We discovered him. We, we found him hanging. Damn. So that was, that was bad. <laughs> wow. And then you, you went through something quite significant as well in prison, and that was the loss of your... My mother. mother. Yeah, mother that was around the same time as I, I found my, my, uh, my yeah. friend dead, actually. I think he got killed a uh, lot long after my mum yeah. had died. How, how was that process like for you? Difficult. Like, in terms of yeah, it was finding difficult. out. And... Yeah, it's still hard to talk about now. But, yeah, I mean, imagine. obviously, I've, it's got better. But mm. Yeah, I mean, it was just the fact that she died whilst I was there, and you know, mm. I never got to say goodbye to her properly. Yeah. 
you know would you say that's your biggest regret it was yeah really, huge yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for sure yeah. I think that that's one of the things like that's one of the takeaways when it, it comes to like losing your freedom and being locked yeah, up yeah I mean that was always my worst fear that that would happen that yeah. Yeah, any of my family would die and in fact in the end not only did my mother die but my auntie died and my cousin all whilst you was in there yeah and you weren't no, able and to all attend. pretty much within about a year and a half of each other yeah uh, and then obviously a load of friends died I lost a girlfriend out there as well she was she got mm. uh, basically poisoned with uh, alcohol well this is one of your girlfriends that was visiting yeah you. yeah yeah a Colombian yeah. girl yeah out there. I've had yeah. three girlfriends die in total well whilst in, in, being in prison one whilst I was out there and two whilst uh, back in Britain wow I've had a lot of people die around me <laughs> Wow. I mean, like, and I've I seen mean, them out. Just whilst you're in the prison, was it was there any support for any of that? Like, was there any no, therapy? Or, no, no. But since you come back, have you had any? Therapy, um, any I did do. I did start yeah. a little bit because of obviously getting diagnosed and yeah. expert. You know, unsurprisingly, with um, PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the PTSD, PTSD if you listen to your stories, <laughs> let, let alone wondering how you feel. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I did start counselling for that and some sort of therapy, but I just found it would make it was making me worse. Yeah, because you're reminiscing and constantly exactly. having to process and discuss and, uh, it. And I would go in there feeling quite happy mm. on a nice sunny day yeah. and come out there in just absolute bits and not yeah. be able to leave my room for about three yeah. days. But, but you think writing and also conversating about your story kind of helps? That helps a lot, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. the catharsis, you know, writing a book and then obviously doing all this sort of stuff helps yeah. a lot because it same sort of processing, really. Yeah. Definitely. I think he- healing is, all, is is about talking through as well. Yeah. And talking through maybe with the right individuals that can maybe reciprocate in the conversation mm, and, yeah, and have yeah. you reflect on it in a, from a different angle. Um, how, how long did you serve before you got released? I did nine years and three months over there and then I got repatriated back to Wandsworth yeah. uh, because the prison out there just became so violent, so dangerous. So you must have been happy now returning back to yeah, the UK. Yeah. yeah. How- so, yeah, got repatriated. My family... It was an eight thousand dollar fine actually with the this, with the sentence as well, mm. which I I refused point blank to pay eight thousand dollars to come back to prison in Britain. <laughs> you know why, I mean? why was that? What was that fine? It, it was just part of the sentence, and and the it had to be paid before you could be repatriated. It was just some weird law. Mm. So my family in the end paid it against my wishes, um, mm. but they just wanted me back, which is understandable. And I was quite relieved when I got back. Yeah. got I'm back to Wandsworth and. Uh, there were people around around the exercise yard crying, going, "Oh my God, ones were so bad, it's terrible." <laughs> you don't have a clue. Like, oh, wow, bro. I mean, honestly, I was, what the? You I said, you in heaven. Is, this is like oh, heaven for me. Yeah. I was like, there's running water just just to begin with. I mean, I can actually turn the tap on and drink yeah. it. Yeah. You know, let alone the fact I've got TV. I'm not going to get shot today or extorted. Mm. You know, I know I'm going to survive today yeah, for a hundred percent. I mean, every day in Ecuador, I woke up thinking. Is this going to be my last day? Mm. Am I going to get shot? Am I going to get stabbed, blown up, whatever? Mm. Yeah, are they going to come for me today? Is yeah. it going to be this day? That level day? of stress alone must have weighed heavily. Every you. day. Yeah. And, well, that, and the worry about the case and the possibility of getting sentenced yeah. again back in prison. I was like, oh. what, what would you say was your <clears> single <throat> biggest factor in keeping you alive? Like what attribute or what was it about you? What did you do? I think the fact that I thought I was going to get out every year, I kept thinking next year I'm going to get out, I'll be yeah. out next year, yeah. and it kept not happening. But then, what at the six year point when I when I went for the, like the fifty percent parole process over there, and they came to me and said, "We're giving you ten percent remission off a twelve year sentence, which is like a year basically." Yeah. yeah. So I said, "So you're telling me I've got to do eleven out of a twelve? And I, you know, I, yeah. yeah, it was just basically I had to restart my sentence. And at that point, my mother had just died. And mm. actually, I was quite thankful because if I'd have had to bring her up and say, sorry, I'm not coming back. I'm going to have to do another five years mm. now mm. after having just done six, mm. you know, and saying all, all throughout that time saying that the worst case, I'll do half mm. and then I'll be out. <clears throat> Can you imagine then having to say to someone, I'm oh, sorry, but I've now got to do the whole sentence again. Yeah. So I, you know, I remember saying to them, so you're telling me that mm. whatever I do now, what, however I behave, whatever I do is not going to affect my time because I'm going to have to do another five years anyway. Mm. So I'm doing the whole sentence. So I can do whatever I want and nothing's going to happen. 
And they were like, yeah. And I said, great. Well, I tell you what, I'm now I'm going to be your worst nightmare. Mm. I'm going to deal drugs. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But, but do, you, do you think that's what kept you alive, though, in the prison by engaging in yeah, those activities? Yeah, I do. I, engaging mm. in it, just becoming part of it. Yeah. So you have to um, get accustomed to the culture. You know? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but you had already developed the drug selling skills outside before yeah. coming in there. So, so I think you're I, well versed you know, in that. And, you know, and then I really did take over the wing. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, you know, and I did start laying down the law. Yeah, you know, I hear that. Then, then they called me Loco Peter, which means Crazy Pete. <laughs> did, did you, you, I mean, as I, I was, you had to be. You had to be. Yeah, had that's to give what off I'm that aura of Yeah, crazy. I mean, do you feel like acting out the role made you become that, or do you think you was that and you just brought it? I was out probably a little bit unhinged anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, you know, you just had to act up to the, you know, make what they thought was crazy and their worst mm. fears come true for them to, <laughs> yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Just and take how, it to long, the next long, level. Yeah. How long did you serve in the UK before you got ultimately I only did 10, 10, 10 months. Oh, okay. That's all that was left because I ended up, by the time I got back, I'd, I'd done virtually all the sentence. So mm. I ended up doing in total 10 years and 10 days. Yeah. So it was all yeah. the 10s. So that's almost like a halfway house for you before coming out and after yeah. the experiences that you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was quite relieved actually that I did that, I did that time at Wandsworth mm. because uh, I never expected that coming back to my own culture, I would experience culture shock. Mm, yeah. Because I thought, well, it's my own culture. I'm coming home, coming back to my language, people I know. Mm. And, but wow. I, yeah, it was for the yeah, first yeah. three to six months, I was, I was in pieces, to be honest. I mean, just everything, for example, in Ecuador, you eat a plate of food out there. If anything's left, you would offer it to anyone. Mm. You'd just say, is anyone hungry? Do you want that? And someone would want it. And everything would get eaten. Everything would get used. There would be never anything gets thrown out. <clears throat> everything would get recycled. I mean, everything would get used, mm. whatever it was. Yeah. Coming back here, first night in it, for example... It was a half a bin of rice, like a big bin, yeah, like refuse yeah. bin, of rice just getting thrown away. And first I was like, world problems. Yeah. yeah. Real first world food problems. Food getting thrown in the bin. I was like, yeah. oh, what are you doing? There's got to be people here that are hungry. Yeah. I was like, you know, because my mindset was so altered by that point. Mm. I was thinking, what the hell are these people doing? This is just insanity. Yeah. You know, and it's just, uh, it was really upsetting as well, because yeah. coming from a third world country where there's so much suffering, and having seen so much suffering and so much hardship, mm. you know, it was, it was upsetting for me to see that sort of level of waste mm. Mm. and just blaséness and all the all the sort of packaging as well mm. that was around it. It's just the, the whole Western society just was a real shock. Mm. Uh, and not only that, I arrived just before Christmas, so it was all the bombarded and you know TV was yeah. just full on advertising and being bombarded with mm. consumerism and all of that it was just like oh mm. god it's just too would you say one of, that's one of the biggest takeaways for you like in terms of like lessons learned throughout this whole process like the value of things and, yeah uh, totally the value of yeah, things yeah, mainly the value yeah. of life and how valuable your life is and how fragile it is yeah. and how easily it can be taken away from you yeah. in a split second when you're least expecting it, you you're you you could be taking your last breath, and you would you you had no idea that was coming. Yeah, and it's all dictated by moment. decisions that we make. Like I mean, I, yeah. I'm I'm one of those individuals. I'm, I'm now I'm becoming very much more conscious about every decision I make, yeah. like every word that comes out of my mouth. Because as as you get older, as we're talking about death earlier, and as you get older, you realize that more people around you start passing, whether it be from old age or because you know vast Definitely. even larger groups of people. So people are passing away and dying, and you realize that your your words and your actions are so powerful. Like. And you don't know where he's going to lead to. What's in going that to sense, lead. as well, your words and your actions is amazing. If you think about it, and everyone should do this, the effect that your one action in a day can have on the amount of people that one action can then affect, mm. with you not even really thinking about it, but because having been locked up there mm. and thinking about these things and realizing that my one action can affect a whole pyramid of people below me, yeah. just you know, for example, me coming up to London today, mm. say if I hadn't have come up to London today, how many people that would have then affected? You know, I've got people waiting to meet me, ex-girlfriend, her kids, they would have all been upset. They in turn have probably changed their plans, 
to be able to meet me at the, the weekend. So that has affected yeah. those people in turn. It's a ricochet that has affected effect. those yeah. people in turn. Yeah. It's the butterf- butterfly effect. Yeah. Your actions and words, mm. you don't realise just how many people's lives you're touching. Yeah. Inadvertently. Most definitely. It's just incredible when you actually start thinking about it. And I, I would wish that more people would mm. because a lot of people don't and their actions are very selfish and very narrow-minded and just have devastating consequences for so many people down yeah. the line. Yeah, and they definitely. don't even realise that they've done it. Yeah, and it definitely seems like you've, you've definitely learned from your mistakes yeah. and uh, the <laughs> stuff that you got involved in and the yeah. process that it's taking you through. I mean, you, you might have gone through something extremely traumatic and, and dramatic and, ex- and of the most extreme but I'm glad but, I did because yeah. it's opened my eyes and it's changed yeah, yeah and you've changed, changed the trajectory of your life now as well because yeah, I mean you're, totally. you're publishing books you're, you're yeah. writing stories you're, you're sharing your experience yeah. in, in the hope that it might deter others because I'm definitely now definitely not going to yeah. get involved into trafficking yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to end up in prison yeah. in Ecuador neither I mean I've um, started going into I've been doing a bit for schools um, schools mm. where you know where the kids have, uh, have been having problems becoming involved with gangs and mm. gang culture so I've been going into those type of schools and, and saying, you know, not going in there and saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't take drugs and being a complete hypocrite because obviously mm. that's just, they're not going to listen to that. Yeah. And they're going to look at me and say, well, hold on a minute, you're a drug trafficker, ex-drug user, mm. and you're coming in and saying, we shouldn't use drugs. They'd be like, fuck off, mm. you know, I, as I would have done as a kid. Mm. So the, the approach is really to go in there and say, well, look, it's up to you if you want to use drugs. That's your decision. But mm. if you do... This is what could happen. Yeah. And certainly if you become involved in trafficking drugs or the sale of drugs and you may, you know, you go down that mm. avenue and that corridor of life mm. to any degree, then you're, it's quite likely that you will end up in a prison like the one I did in, mm. but you probably will not make it out alive. Yeah. Because I can tell you now, most people didn't. I'm a very lucky person. Yeah. The, the the average lifespan of someone out there, you're lucky if you make it past four years wow. or four or five years. I remember when I first went into the prison there, they said, if you make it past four or five years, you're very lucky because either you'll, you'll end up dead because you'll end up mm. in trouble or you'll have a problem with someone in there, you'll end up in a fight or some sort of problem, some sort mm. of grief, or you'll end up sick. Because you think four or five years in a South American prison or developing world country mm. um, is a long time and it takes a toll on your health. And Sorry, <laughs> I'm talking of which. Mm. <clears throat> it wears you down, just the diet, the general conditions, the stress of it all. Mm. You know, it all takes a toll on your health. And anything past five years, you know, you start to feel it. I would see people's faces change. Yeah. You know, they they would take on a different demeanor, and you know, you 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 know the ones that have been in prison a long time out yeah. there because they just right. wrecked. Yeah. Quite frankly. No, I mean, it's it's, a, it's been amazing to hear your story, Pete. To be honest with you, like it's it's definitely hit me back, and yeah. I mean, it's I'm. I'm, I'm honoured that you came on the podcast well, and also <laughs> I appreciate your life that you made it through whatever yeah. it is that you made it through and you, you survived the prison and I definitely um, hope that you do get more like help and support in regards to like obviously the PTSD yeah I think I still stuff. need it for sure <laughs> it's, it's vital I definitely think it's vital mm. I think everyone goes everyone goes around carrying burdens like we all carry burdens yeah. like, I carry yeah. my own burden through my own history and my own trauma mm. and it's good that we discuss it and find ways of overcoming it and using it for the, the positive and showcasing others which you're doing now because yeah. you've yeah. turned your life around which is amazing um but what, what you got coming up that you like the people to know about in terms of like your projects and also um, tell them a bit about the book and why they should definitely go and read it i mean after after listening yeah, to your yeah. story now <laughs> they're definitely going to go and check yeah, out the book should, yeah, because should, it has it in detail exactly yeah. yeah you should definitely buy it. it's called ellen fiona which mm. you mentioned earlier i'm gonna have the link in the bio and everything and promote it on my socials okay so, yeah. thanks yeah. yeah so i mean that's published by ebri penguin available on amazon for about eight quid um obviously that goes into a lot more detail Still not everything, because 10 years is a lot to cram into 300 yeah. pages. Yeah. But um, it goes into a lot more detail and there's a lot more stories in there about, you know, things that happened and what I went through out there. Mm. Um, you know, obviously you can watch the Banged Up Applaud episode on mm. Nat Geo, which again, they've done a, some good reenactments on there. Yeah. I mean, they're not completely correct because obviously they, they could, you know, they had to bend it a little bit. But I mean, they, they are basically as it happened. Mm. 
Um, this is, I've done stuff on Vice Online, which I I think people... I mean, to be honest, I don't watch these things. Yeah. I've done them, and I, I've not actually ever watched the Bang Different Rule or the yeah. Vice stuff, because I find it very difficult to watch it. Yeah, A, lived because it, the yeah. emotions, B, because I've lived it, and C, because yeah. it's just weird watching yourself on TV and stuff Yeah, I like can that. imagine, yeah. I hardly watch my podcast, but yeah, <laughs> that, I just that's different weird. from watching your life story back, so... <laughs> but, um, yeah, as you know, I'd like to, you know, everyone else, yeah, go ahead and watch it because, you know, you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on the prequel to El Infierno, which is going to detail my life before mm. and all the adventures that we got up to whilst trafficking and the crazy stories that mm. I've got to tell. When is that coming out? Um, I'm just working on it now, mm. so I'd reckon, you can say, give it about a year. Okay, I'll keep an eye out for it, so yeah, when yeah. it does come out, I'll push that as well. We'll have a discussion yeah. about that once that comes out. Yeah. So is it, I can give you the title now, though, I think. Yeah. Um, don't hold me to this, though, yeah. but it's going to be called Plastic Gangsters, of course. Plastic Gangsters? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how comes? Well, because we were, we were making the, the cocaine into plastic. Oh, okay, oh, okay, I see. And also yeah. play on words, plastic gangsters, plastic gangsters fake, fake gangsters, because yeah. we weren't gangsters, do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, you became one. Yeah, but we became one, into it. that yeah. is about the first line of the book, actually, that's oh, okay. pretty much how it's going to read. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I appreciate that, Pete. Thanks for coming on this Humans podcast, right. and we're definitely going to catch me. up again, so, guys, thank you. Chase, chase, Boom, chase, that was amazing. Chase, chase,